any Ugandan out there who wants to run or start a business is that uh, you need to be able to track everything that matters. So the digital channels allow you to track the things that matter. And my view has always been this. If you cannot track something, you cannot steer that. And if you cannot steer it, then you don't have a good business environment. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you aspire for a booming middle-class economy? Listen along to understand what turns the wheels of Uganda's economy with our lineup of credible influencers in their fields. Selling online might seem like a simple goal, but there are many aspects to the process from deciding on an e-commerce platform to thinking about digital asset management. Our guest today is an authority in the industry. His name is synonymous with selling quality and essential services online, food and shop that is. Uh, just the right person to take us through this conversation. With managing an e-commerce market leader that's open in about 14 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, an open online market consultant in digital, Ron Kamara, CEO, Jumia Uganda. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Aggie. So I'm your host today, Agi Patricia Turomoy, a PR specialist with 8020 Marketing. What's hot in the e-commerce yeah. right now? Help us understand the wider what? ecosystem in which e-commerce platforms operate. Well, I think uh, things have changed in the last two years. Well, I have to say that uh, e-commerce has been growing quite fast in the last 10 years. Drumia and other players growing quite significantly in Uganda and across the region. But historically, we've been plagued by issue of trust. We saw a lot of customers and even the biggest brands were still not comfortable trading online. And this is a historical issue that we see in the market to do with the authenticity of products uh, that we see with generally the apprehension of consumers from buying online. What we saw in the last 10 years is customers, the early adopters who went online were quite happy with the service and were coming back more and more. But um, the onset of COVID-19 has changed the dynamics of this. And what we saw is that uh, people had to stay home, uh, businesses had to close. So the online or e-commerce space became the safe option for people to stay home and stay safe but also to continue to transact and get home delivery. Uh, we saw businesses uh, finding for alternative ways to continue to survive during COVID. So the online space offered an incredible opportunity for the ecosystem. We saw people who were never interested in online business, especially the informal sector, market vendors, smaller sellers, also going online, starting websites. We saw the big giants globally, the Amazons growing, incredibly fast month over month during these times. And uh, it's not just that, the whole ecosystem, the logistics companies. We saw a lot of uh, startups come in to be able to support the booming e-commerce. So logistics players, fintech players were also seeing a boom. And uh, we saw that Ugandans and Africans used e-commerce, used tech to be able to navigate what has been a very challenging last uh, year and a half. And for me, what's exciting is that it seems like it's sticking. The customers right. who came during these months and weeks are coming back. They're happy with e-commerce. So it's an exciting time for the industry in Uganda, across Africa, especially for the businesses that do benefit from such restaurants who have suffered quite a lot, small sellers. Another segment that is very important to note has been the tier two, tier three towns. Those are areas outside of the major capital cities. During lockdown, these areas were totally cut off because uh, a lot of the cargo typically moves in passenger vehicles. But even in the best of times, tier two and tier three towns don't have access to good retail. So the value proposition of online business has always been strong for those towns. But COVID-19 made it an incredible offer. Uh, now we see a big chunk of our businesses going to tier two and tier three towns than before in the past. You make such valid points there, but we'll come to that. And recently you led a team of the E-Trade Association 
to request for the lift on curfew and also Facebook. How far is that coming? Well, I think that um, these times have been extremely difficult and on many fronts. And number one is that uh, people don't have money, so we can't afford any additional barriers to our businesses. And so one of the things we've been engaging government on is the unintended consequences of actions like banning of Facebook. Now, Facebook, for example, is the single biggest community of Ugandans. People transact and sell. For many of our online platforms, it's a gateway to log in. But also, almost 60% of customers we acquire are coming through Facebook marketing. And so it has become extremely difficult to acquire customers without Facebook. And when Ugandans use VPN, uh, it's very difficult to segment and target them. It's not safe for them. So we've been pushing government to reconsider this decision. Uh, and so we hope that uh, we will be able to get there. I think government now has begun to understand that blocking Facebook does not really penalize Facebook because Facebook has no presence in Uganda. Facebook takes only a few million dollars of revenue in advertising every year from Uganda. It's a small drop in the ocean. Those who are penalized are the small businesses, the SMEs, companies like Jumia. So we're making that case on the curfew. Mm -hmm. Our case has always been that delivery curfew for motorcycles is at 6 p.m., which does not make sense because we need to be able to execute delivery for our customers, for our vendors, to customers who are coming from home, who are going home, and that's after work. So we felt it was a regressive to affect our operations this way, and we've been making the case that delivery curfew, motorcycle curfew, should be extended to the normal curfew that we can mm -hmm get back to normal, especially on the delivery end. And from what you're saying, I gather the evolving nature of e-commerce means there's a continuous set of new trends, technology and terminology to get to grips with. What's the role of Jumia on the continent? Jumia, we are certainly the leading tech company on the continent. We're operating uh, in more than 11 markets. Um, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of sellers and we have millions of active customers. And so our role for me is very critical in the ecosystem. I think that uh, we have played an important role of educating the customers. Before we opened, selling and buying online was not there. And so we have played an incredible role of educating the consumer and educating the vendors, getting the big brands to trust in selling online. We have built the support ecosystem of logistics. Logistics has been very difficult across the continent to be able to do. And so we've built an incredible network of warehouses, pickup stations, delivery agents that reaches everybody in our markets. In Uganda today, we delivered every district. And so this ecosystem has been extremely important. Now vendors, the public can even tap into this and be able to ship their products through Jumia. Um, another point where we felt we've had a big impact is on the payment systems. We know that Uganda and many African markets are cash-based. And for e-commerce and for delivery, this makes it very difficult. This means that customers do not take ownership of the products at the point of purchase. When customers select cash on delivery, there's a higher chance they will change their mind. They will buy something else. And so you end up having failed deliveries that affect the pricing overall, that affect vendors. And by investing in our own proprietary uh, payment solution called Jumia Pay, where consumers can be able to pay with Visa, MasterCard, mobile money schemes, but also we can lend to our own vendors. And so we've been able to bring the fintech space closer to the people. We've been able to bring lending closer to the people. So the impact is on the vendors, on the customers. On the other part, where Jumia has played a strong role is in the talent pool that we have in our markets. When we opened, we didn't have a lot of people experienced in digital marketing, commercial negotiation, high-level reporting in accounting. So we had to hire young people, train them. And today, a lot of the alumni from Jumia have gone on to start their own companies, tech companies across Africa. Many of them have received incredible funding. Others are leading the top tech companies across the globe. So the impact of Jumia on talent growth has been uh, remarkable as the first mover. And we take pride in this. We have opened a tech hub in Lagos, a tech hub in, in Egypt, tech hub in South Africa, where we're training young developers to become top computer engineers and to develop the tools that will run the economy of tomorrow.